Not sure what else to say this morning other than buckle up. I have a lot of ground to cover. But I'm going to try to do it in brief and hopefully meaningful. But again, I am so inadequate and doing such an inadequate job. And I don't mean that as some sort of false humility. It is God's word and we are in awe of it. But I hope that in some way I am encouraging you to look deeper at these passages and to consider this portion of God's Word as valuable as you would any other. And so as we think about these things that we have learned together this week, I would encourage you to, to pay attention to this lesson as well. I think if there were just one lesson, if I just had one lesson that I could present from Leviticus I think it would be this one. And so I want us to think carefully about the Lord's words of love your neighbor. We see that given for us in Leviticus, the 19th chapter. The end of verse 18. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And again, it's another one of the I am the Lord statements. You are very likely familiar with this command. You may have even known that it came from Leviticus. And sort of like the the negative passage of uh, the story of Nadab and Abihu, this encouraging admonition to love your neighbor may also be one that you would have recognized if you were asking for it. Well, name all the passages that you know from Leviticus. This may very well have come to your to your mind. But have you thought about how prevalent it is taught throughout the scriptures based upon this example? It is according to the Lord and according to the Jews of Jesus' day. This was not something new with Jesus that that he revealed this to them. They understood that it was the second greatest commandment. And let me just make note that if the second greatest of God's commandments are found in the book of Leviticus... Might we ought to conclude that there's also some other really good things in there? And so it just encourages me, inspires me to want to know this book even better. But we're going to examine this teaching of Leviticus and make note in the 19th chapter that this passage is not told in a vacuum. And so we begin in verse 13. He says, you shall not defraud your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. And so don't defraud who? Your neighbor. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice or judgment in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go about as a talebearer among the peoples, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so we have stated for us in verses 13 and verse 15, 16, 17, and 18, these neighborly passages. And so when, we, when Jesus refers us to, and the New Testament writers refer us to, loving your neighbor, there is a, a broader text there. And I would just suggest that maybe nearly every time, I'm going to have that slight disclaimer there, Nearly every time that you find a quote of the Old Testament in, located somewhere in the New Testament, the writer or the author of that is begging you to go back and look at the greater context. You know, that's what we, we are enriched when we do that. When you find a passage, I'll just give you a quick example of that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus utters on the cross. Well, he's wanting us to reflect back to Psalm 22. And you see those first 21 and a half verses of what's taking place on and around the cross. And then that glorious passage in Psalm 22 and verse 22 as well. 
where he acknowledges us as his brethren, that he will proclaim us as his brethren. And so that one phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is, is, is calling upon us. Go back and study the context of that over and over. I think we see that in scriptures, certainly in the Levitical passages, you'll see that as well. But as we think about this, it is taught all over the New Testament. And so follow along with me as we go on this quick trip through the neighborly passages. Matthew, the fifth chapter. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus corrects not the Old Testament law, but their application of it. That is, I think, clear in several of these examples that Jesus gives. But in verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, we didn't read anything of the kind about hating your enemy in Leviticus 19. But that was their conclusion to it. Well, if we love our neighbor, then we hate everybody else. We hate the Gentiles. Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do that? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the idea of perfection there is, is complete in goodness. That, that is our goal. It, it is to, that, that we would just be full of the goodness that is manifested in God that we see Him giving to us, such as the rain that He describes and the sun in verse 45. But we are commanded to love. And the idea of loving your neighbor is even if your neighbor is, may I say, a jerk. Even if he's not a good guy. Even if he throws trash in your yard. We are to love our neighbor. And we'll see that our neighbor includes the guy that cuts us off on the interstate. Our neighbor is the individual that maybe has said something bad about us. Look at the applications in verse 44. Those who curse you, those who hate you, those who spitefully use and persecute you, those are sometimes our neighbors. And if we're only treating nicely the people that have been kind to us, well, we're no better than the world. In, in the workplace, you, you see that happening, right? Uh, you know, you, you help me, I help you, but for the person that doesn't, well, we're just going to let them drown. No, we need to be the ones that reach out like God has to us. And so friends and enemies are our neighbors. We also find, Matthew seemed to like this passage in Leviticus, in Matthew, the 19th chapter, rather lengthy story of this man who, when we compile Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, we see him as indeed a rich young ruler. And he comes running to Jesus, and he asks Jesus this amazing question, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus challenges his understanding of who the Lord is. Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to them, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so as Jesus begins to enumerate the, some of the Ten Commandments, make note that he doesn't speak of the first four, not because they are unimportant, but he's talking to this rich young ruler about what he needs to do. And so he talks about, we sort of have the, the vertical commandments, the first four of the Ten Commandments, our relationship with God. And then the latter six are primarily horizontal commandments, how we treat one another, don't murder, don't commit adultery, and so forth, the things that he has listed here. 
And then Jesus sums up those last six commandments by saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's not one of the Ten Commandments, but it is what is embodied in the, those. And the man says, all these things I have kept from my youth, and perhaps he really believes that he's done that perfectly. Maybe he's saying, I've been good at that or whatever. Jesus doesn't even challenge that, but says, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. But the young man Heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And so loving your neighbor is a question of eternal life. That's how this conversation got started. What may I do, what should I do to have eternal life? And he's offered life in verse 17. He's offered treasure in heaven in verse 21. But he goes away sorrowful. And this is one of those passages where I want to know how his life ended. I, that's just that's the curiosity part of me. The Lord has said, Joe, you don't need to know that part. Because really, like so many of these stories, I believe that we are left to ponder that to make the personal application. How will my life end as I find myself in similar situations? Am I more enamored and focused on and desiring of the riches of life than of imitating our Lord and of doing uh, what he has instructed us to do, to loving my neighbor? Am I willing to uh, forego uh, the, the time and a half perhaps or the, the pay raise or maybe the promotion that I could get if I just do that little bit more, but that's going to mean that I've got to neglect some relationships. And I'm not at all condemning promotions or pay raises or advancements in workplace. But we need to be careful that we don't become like this rich young ruler where we become so focused on getting what we feel like we need in life to have a security, to get enough possessions. You may have seen the slogan, he who dies with the most toys wins. It needs to be rewritten. He who dies with the most toys dies like anybody else. He doesn't take those things with him. And as somebody once said, if he could, they would burn. And so great possessions isn't an answer to eternal life. But sometimes we have to make those choices. The disciples went on as Jesus teaches them in verse 23. Assuredly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Disciples heard that they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. He says, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. <laughs> it's impossible. You see how Jesus has amplified the emphasis on this? And we say, well, I'm glad I'm not rich. I don't know your financial status this morning. But dare I say, the odds are you are rich. And you need to see yourself as wealthy. We have, we have tricked ourselves into thinking that only the Gates and the Zuckerbergs of the world are the rich ones, and we're not. If you would compare the wages of everyone around the world, you would be almost certainly in the class of the rich. If you would dare to calculate the wealth of everyone who has ever lived, you would almost certainly find yourself as a one percenter. You, we are living in a time, I mean, just think about all the servants that you have, right? And people are like, wait, wait, I, I don't have any servants. Uh, you probably do. They're just mechanical, like a washing machine and a dryer and a dishwasher and a car, and we have all of these conveniences. They serve us. They are, we, have, we just have tremendous servants around us. We are, 
We are so wealthy, and we have tricked ourselves. But I don't have the newest. And so by that delusion, we think these passages don't apply to us. But we need to step back and say, oh, I need to be careful. I need to see, am I that rich young ruler who is not responding? Or maybe I'm like the disciple, Peter, who when Jesus says these things, Peter says, see, we've left everything to follow you. Like, what, what's, what about our reward? You, you can almost hear the, the question coming with that, I believe. Therefore, what shall we have? The end of verse 27. And Jesus says, Surely I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you have followed me, will, will sit, you have, who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And so the question began, what must I do to have eternal life? And the text closes in verse 29 with that of everlasting or eternal life. And again, just recognize how true that is. This is one of those passages that I'm not going to argue with Scripture, but it is indeed an understatement on my part. I have not received a hundredfold. I have not received a thousandfold. I don't know what the number would be. Tens of thousands fold without question. It is amazing how much God takes care of us through his people. And so we have indeed been greatly, greatly blessed. But with those blessings comes the responsibility to love our neighbor as ourself. So let's make sure that we don't lose sight of what's truly important of life and what we're doing with our time. The law and the prophets, again, Matthew chapter 22, the parallel text in Mark, the 12th chapter. This day of great questions, pay taxes, the resurrection, and then verse 34, Matthew 22, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked them a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, what is the great, great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I think from that vantage point you can see those those first four commandments of the 10 are loving God, part of loving God with your whole being. And the latter six the commandments from Moses and Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 and Leviticus 19 would be the loving your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Name any command of scripture that doesn't fit under one of those two categories, loving God or loving your neighbor. You can't do it. Everything that God has taught us to do fits under one of those two uh, headings. And so we need to see that these are the greatest commandments. And they don't cancel each other out. They go together as a set. If you're truly not loving your neighbor as yourself, then you've not put God in first place in your heart. And if you have put first, God first place in your heart, you are going to treat others as, they, as we ought to. Mr. Rogers is one of my favorites. And so in Luke, the 10th chapter, we have this Mr. Rogers type conversation. In verse 25... Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, What is written in the law? What you're reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And this is Jesus speaking, verse 28. He said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus. 
Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him, went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend when I come, I'll repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? He said to him, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Well, the Lord is not going to allow us to justify ourselves. You know, we, we have these indicting passages. You know, it's passages like this that, that cause me to, to think more deeply it was some years back as I was headed to the church building and out on one of the main roads there had been an accident and one of the cars was actually flipped upside down and uh, the occupants were in their seatbelts trapped in that. The other vehicle was banged up very bad. There was a head-on collision and uh, the driver of that vehicle was sitting out in the street bleeding and as I was one of the first people to come upon that scene. My mind quickly said, you're not a medic. You don't have an ambulance. You're not qualified for this. You just need to call 911 and keep driving. Just get out of the way sort of thing. I said, I, I can't do that. And this is not at all to brag on myself because I think you would have done the same thing. But we do that because we see passages like this. When individuals are in need we need, to, we need to be that neighbor. It's not about the question of who is my neighbor, but as Jesus turned that in verse 36, so which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him? It's not a question of who is my neighbor, but won't you be a neighbor? Won't you allow me to help you? I, I need to have that Spirit of go and do likewise. And quite likely you've heard lessons from this text, the contrast of, of the religious individuals that, that went to the other side of the road and sometimes we're tempted to, to, to do that. Maybe we're busy. Maybe we don't want to get involved. Maybe the thieves are still around. We, we don't know what dangers are lurking. And I'm not suggesting that in every situation, everybody should stop. I caution my wife and my daughters. There are different circumstances where it's appropriate and not. But we need to be a neighbor. We need to see that I need to be reaching out and, and helping people. And being like the Lord. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, talk about John does not. He doesn't ever say that we ought to love our neighbors ourselves. He just says, love one another <laughs> over and over and over again. It's his paraphrase. The phrase love one another is found 22 times in the New Testament. Ten of those are by John. And so if you want to just understand what loving your neighbor looks like, it's whoever you're near. Again, I just want to tie that in to the, the Mr. Rogers because I don't know all of his religious, uh, what, what his religious beliefs were, but the way that he lived his life, one of the things that he's taught was the most important person to you needs to be the one right in front of you. Don't be so preoccupied with where you're going or who you're going to see but focus on the person right in front of you. I don't always do that well, but I'm more like the Lord when I take that counsel. And so we need to love one another. In Romans, the 13th chapter. Verse 8. 
Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. We ought not to default on our debts. We need to repay. But there is one debt we need to view. There's one thing that I am constantly paying. We always owe our love to each other. Owe no man anything except to love one another. We always owe that. I am indebted to do that. The Lord has loved me so much that I must love others. I must want to love others. Galatians, the fifth chapter. I'll not read all of this text, but beginning in verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. And then in that context, he talks about the contrast of uh, walking in the spirit versus the flesh. And so love is seen in service. Sometimes we think that love is an emotion and is a feeling, and it can be used that way. But love is an action. We need to be practicing, and we do that, according to this passage, by serving one another. And and so this is just a a challenging passage, and I mean that literally. It it ought to challenge us. What have I done in service to others? And, And not just to the ones that have already served me or might serve me. What have I done in serving others who maybe have nothing that I know to offer me in return? And then the royal law in James 2. Would it be fair to say, whether it is your answer or not, that most Christians would say the most practical book of the Scriptures, or at least of the New Testament, is the book of James? I mean, I hear that all the time, and I I would not argue with that. Extremely practical book. Just so many ways in which we can put into application the teachings of James. And and they're clear. They're down to earth. The message is is not muddled at all. And so in James 2 and in verse 1, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of our glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings, fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, Oh, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you sit there. Sit right here, my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves? Become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to scriptures, you shall love your neighbors yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And so we see the command to love one another. We think back to uh, verse 27. I really should have begun reading there. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Those who are helpless, those who do not have a voice to defend them, the widows, the orphans. We need to love them as ourselves. And so as we think about this idea of the royal law, you have that statement given in verse 8. But if you really fulfill the royal law and You can read some commentaries about what this idea of the royal law means. And I'm just kind of a simple guy, so I'm I'm just going to approach that simply. When we think of royal or royalty, we think of the king. 
And so this is the king's law. This is the royal law. Not as if the other laws and scriptures don't come from the king. But, but this is his law. This is the one that, that he would have uh, written up on his wall or whatever the case might be. This is the royal law. Loving your neighbor as yourself. And so maybe we'll take just a couple of moments to uh, think through what James calls this law of liberty in verse 25 and uh, in uh, chapter 2. And in verse 12, 125 and 212, the law of liberty, not liberty to do what we want, but the liberty, the freedom that we find from sin that causes us to live in a very distinct way of loving our neighbor as ourself. And so James is such a practical book. So let's just forget about Leviticus for a moment. You know, I'm not speaking the truth there. Leviticus is such a practical book. I, I hope that I can do this some justice here. In James 5 and in verse 4, you have, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. And what we read earlier, in Leviticus chapter 19 and in verse 13. You shall not defraud your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. Don't defraud the worker. Leviticus said that. James says to that, amen. You have in James 2 what we just read in verses 1 through 9 of don't be partial, the rich man and the poor man. And, and that could, that's just one example, right? It could be black and white. It could be college educated and illiterate. Uh, it could be English speaker or a, someone who uh, has another language. We just need to not be partial. And so in verse 15 of Leviticus 19, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor. Now, what an amazing coincidence that we find uh, James 5 talking about defrauding uh, the farmer and Le Leviticus had talked about that. And then just an amazing coincidence that James had also talked about specifically not being partial against the poor and Leviticus had talked about that. Coincidence or pattern? In uh, verse 19 of Levi uh, verse 16 of Leviticus 19. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. And in James 4, and in verses 11 and 12, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. So don't go about talking bad. Leviticus says that, and James says he agrees. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you're the judge of the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? And so don't be a talebearer. Don't try to destroy other people. Leviticus said that, and James says, amen. Rebuke your neighbor. In James 5, verses 19 and 20, he concludes his teaching. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, so somebody is sinning and they've been rebuked, they've been taught. Let him, who know, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. He says in Leviticus 19, 17, You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your brother and not bear, his sin, and he, and, and not bear uh, sin because of him. And then, as we've already stated, in Chapter 19 and in verse 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But he even says in James 5 and in verse 9, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be con condemned. And in James, uh, in Leviticus 19, 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge. This can't just be like, wow, they happen to get some of the same sort of things. Uh, as I've stated with some other examples, like with First Peter 
It's almost as if Peter had his scroll opened to the Mount Sinai events as he was writing in those first couple of chapters. I think James says, hey, Peter was on to something. This is such a practical lesson found in the heart of Leviticus. Leviticus 19, 13 through 18. And so again... When the scriptures give us a quote, like over and over, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans, Galatians, what what did I leave out there? Uh, Love your neighbor as yourself. The text is begging us, and James says, please do it. Go back and look at the greater context. Because loving your neighbor as yourself really means all of these things. It's the royal law. It's, It's the summation of the way that we're going to treat one another, loving your neighbor as yourself. Again, if there were one sermon that I could preach from Leviticus, it would be to show how prevalent the second greatest commandment is for us. That that we would come to appreciate and to apply what God expects of us. We'll talk in the afternoon lesson, Lord willing, more about who Jesus is. But we see him embodying this concept of loving your neighbor as yourself. From heaven to earth, he became our neighbor so that you and I could be saved. And so if you are willing this morning to submit to him, to realize that that I've not been the kind of person that I ought to be, and I guess I should caution there, all of us should feel the, the tinge, the, the, the guilt in that. We can surely think of times where I could have done better. And so let these scriptures work on your heart. But if you've not come to the Lord, don't forget that first great commandment. To love God with your whole being. Because if you just try to love your neighbor as yourself without putting God first, you're not going to know how to do that. We have to have a relationship with the Creator to greatly appreciate the creation. And so if we can assist you in coming to God or returning to Him this morning, please let it be known while together we stand and sing.